Hey, this is Leighton from Just Collect and Vintage Breaks. Thanks for tuning in today and stopping by. So I had the good fortune recently to do a road trip, but not a regular road trip. This is in search of baseball card treasure. This time I headed to one of the best sports cities in the entire United States. And that is just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And I spent some time in Boston. I also spent some time in Springfield, Massachusetts, and was able to spend a couple hours at the Basketball Hall of Fame. So this gentleman contacted us, and we were so very excited when he originally reached out. We kind of glossed over and assumed that because he was from the Northeast, that he would either ship the cards or come on down. But as we learned more about his extensive vintage sports card collection he let us know that he would not be shipping the cards and that even though he was only about four and a half hours away he really wanted someone that someone being yours truly to come up and visit him and so after we did some due diligence we also did a preliminary evaluation for some of his cards and because they were graded largely by PSA and SGC we were able to provide to him a preliminary evaluation on a handful of the graded cards, we let him know what we thought they were worth as well as what we would pay for them. And when we agreed, that gave me the comfortability and the impetus to plan a buying trip to the New England area. The gentleman has been in the same home for nearly six decades, but the home was built in 1782. So he had me up, I drove up on a Thursday and this collection was so massive that we ended up meeting two different times. So when I first got there, it was really a trip in terms of the backyard. He had all this wonderful space. And I thought to myself, like, wow, you know, I really would love to live here myself if I was gonna live out, you know, the suburbs. And I was thinking like, you know, if you're a musician, an artist, lo and behold, Frank is an artist and operates out of the barn just off of the house it was really just an awesome experience to spend the time with someone who not just appreciates, of course, sports cards, but the beauty of them, the aesthetics, the eye appeal. And so as I got to know Frank, before we even got started, I had a really good feeling about the collection. But of course, as I always share with folks, you know, even if you're uh, someone who's done, you know, many a deal before, you often get butterflies again. Well, I had those butterflies as I entered into Frank's home, because you never know what's going to happen. But this time, I knew no matter what, even if I didn't get the collection, I was gonna make sure that I breathed in some of that really nice country air and got to know Frank a little bit. And it seemed to all work out because we were able to buy a wonderful collection, but more on that later. So I get to Frank's you know, main area. And I'm like, so Frank, where's the collection? So he wants to talk a little bit turkey first and explained to me how he went through everything. I really appreciated that. He was really well organized. And that allowed me to go through everything a little bit more easily and take my notes diligently as I went through. And just to explain to folks what I did kind of like at a macro level is I go through and I try to identify what someone has in their collection first. I don't often write down what I think it's worth as I'm going because I feel as though it's a lot more efficient to go through an inventory what someone has. And there was a large portion of the collection that was also ungraded. So I spend my time focusing on that. And then depending on the volume of the collection, I'll either go through and do the pricing right then, or I'll do it that evening and then I'll reconvene the next day. And so in this particular case, Frank had 14 boxes, all filled with vintage sports cards Anything and everything ranging from Tito 6s from the 1910 time period all the way up to several dozen 1952 Topps cards rated PSA 7 or higher. Lots of really fun cards mixed in between and a couple cards later in the 50s and the 60s and then the collection kind of tails off from there as it's mostly vintage. So what was great as I went through box number one, it was fairly chronological. And as we got to Gaudi's, the 33s weren't mixed with the 34s. The sevens weren't mixed with the threes. So thank you, Frank, this is a shout out. I very much appreciate how well organized you were. 
It made everything that much easier for both of us to understand what you had and what I thought it was worth, and therefore I could take it and then make an offer on the collection. And that's what we did. But we did it over, I would say, probably a four or five hour period. We were going box after box, and then ultimately we hit, I'm like, wait a minute, Frank, we've hit ungraded? Is there any more graded throughout the collection? He said, no, wait, you see how organized I am. That's the last of the graded. He even had graded non-sport, a little bit of that, but then moved on to ungraded. And I'm thinking, by the way, because in this collection, as you're watching this video, you're reading our blog at blog.justcollect.com, I'm thinking, well, the graded cards are like, they're gonna be the best part. And he had PSA 7 1933 Gaudi cards, which are awesome. So when I got to the ungraded, and I'm seeing some Hall of Famers, I'm seeing cards that look raw, X to X mint. For those that are watching this video that don't quite know how that equates to numbers, X is about a five, X mint is a six. So when you're looking at all these ungraded cards in really better than average condition, I took a moment and I said, Frank, what's going on here? Like you've been holding out for all these decades? So Frank told me the story of his collection as we went through for hours and hours. And what's fantastic about Frank is he fell in love with the game of baseball much about the same time that he fell in love with art. And so what he did when he bought cards, even though he knows, and he's gonna watch this video, that he would have preferred to also buy the Babe Ruths or in addition to the 33 Gaudi PSA 7 Commons, buy a Babe Ruth. He also wanted Lou Gehrig's, but Frank was realistic about what his budget could allow him to purchase. And so he decided to purchase really great looking cards from a wonderful time period, like Tito Sixes from the 1910s or Diamond Stars, even though there's no big Hall of Fame rookie, we were going over some of the Hall of Famers he had. And the art is incredible. So we're moving on through the collection, and I said to him, because I could tell he was really attached, I said, Frank, before I go through and do the evaluation later, even though I want to buy them all, if any of the cards that we're going through mean something to you, but he really took a serious approach to going through it and making sure that, hey, if he reached a fair deal, that he wasn't gonna have any regrets. So we hit this ungraded portion, and I said to him, like, you know, why didn't you have any of these cards graded? It was very straightforward. Like, I, I didn't quite get it. But everything was authentic. Everything looked to check out. And so he's telling me the story. He's like, wait, I didn't get into collecting cards for money. I would take the little bit of extra money I had during my journey of life, and I would go out and buy some 1952s. But the reason why I wasn't buying, you know, the Mantle, the Maze, the Jackie, the Canty, etc., is because not only could I not afford them, but if he bought one of those big ones, he said he was gonna lose that fun and that adventure of searching out those other cards which he could afford. And I kind of get that as a collector myself, because I know as a really young kid in my teens that people have asked me, like, you know, why didn't you buy Mickey Mantle autographs for $10? When you were a kid, you know, you went to those card shows and I did it. But the truth be told is I didn't have a budget that was much bigger than 10 or $20. And so that money came from me mowing lawns and doing those kinds of things like paper routes, et cetera, chores. And so when I went to a card show as a kid, I wanted a lot of cards. And even though I was aware of a Ty Cobb, I'm like, no, but even if I can afford it, I would only have one card. So Frank did a really good job of balancing his budget and buying some amazing cards along the way. But he did have some fantastic Hall of Famers and rookie cards throughout his collection and really had a great eye because he was buying, you know, Nearman cards that were either already graded or lots of his ungraded cards, which we'll share with you. They look great and it's coming from a true collector. So Frank, I hope we're making you proud with this video. We got to the end of the collection and there was a few cards like in, you know, different types of grading companies that maybe weren't big grading companies. So we either gave them back to him because they weren't worth that much, or I explained to him, hey, this is what it's worth. And he said, you know, I don't want that. It's a bad memory for me. But you know, he bought these cards, of course, with the best of intentions. But if you take one message away from this video, it's this little nugget right here. Let the buyer beware. If you're going out as a collector and you're spending your hard earned money, be careful about which grading company you decide to collect because there are several big grading companies that are all reputable. But some of the grading companies that he had showed me 
have been out of business, in some cases, for over 10 years. So do your best when you're looking at cards to not just buy the actual holder, meaning it says PSA 7 or you know SGC 6, but try to understand what a 6 or a 7 might look like so that when you see it in the holder, you'll feel comfortable, especially if you're writing a six-figure check for a big collection such as Frank's. So we did all this work, but I did something I thought was smart to start the day. I said, Frank, I'm looking at these 14 boxes. How late do we want to work tonight? And he's, you know, Frank's an older gentleman. He said, what do you mean, late? I said, well, you know, do we want to burn the midnight oil? We're going to be ordering pizzas. And he said, well, you know, I was going to offer to take you to dinner. And I thought that was very sweet of him. So I explained to Frank in the beginning of the day that it was unlikely for me to go through the collection diligently, methodically, take great notes, etc., and also price the cards out and not end before 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And I explained to him, I didn't want to rush. I will if I have to. And if you don't want me to rush, would you be okay with reconvening the next morning on that Friday? And he said, you know, Layton, I don't play golf on Fridays. No problem. So we worked it out and he appreciated the serious nature that I had about going through his collection and then also evaluating. And evaluating just for the folks out there, it's not just looking at an ungraded card and deciding what condition it's in, but then taking that condition and figuring out what I think it's worth. And when you have to do that for, oh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of graded vintage cards, along with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ungraded vintage cards from 33 galleries, 34 galleries, Diamond Stars, T206s, there was a lot of work to do. So one of the things I also like to try to caution folks, whether it be you're buying a collection yourself, or if you're going to a dealer at a convention, you're going to a card shop, and you feel overwhelmed, but in a good way, like you're really excited. There's nothing wrong with talking to that card shop owner or to that dealer and say to them, you know, I wanna go through five of your binders, and I'm looking at the time, it's 3.30, the shop closes at five. Could you maybe stay a little bit late today, please? Or if you're at the card show, Maybe asking the dealer what time they get there in the morning, would it be okay to make an appointment with them so you could be their first customer? These are all wonderful things that happen when you feel comfortable communicating. And after doing this for nearly 30 years and having bought and sold over $50 million of vintage cards, I not only of course do this for a living, but I have a lot of fun doing it. And so I told Frank, I will do whatever you need me to do. If you need to finish it today, we'll get it done. He appreciated my transparent nature and the way that I was trying to lay out for him how it handles collection. And so what we ended up electing to do is we took basically a dinner break. I went back to eat some really good barbecue that was recommended to me. And I basically worked for three, four hours that night. I woke up 6.30 a.m. the next day, finished it in the morning, but then I had to go back through and double check because as I mentioned, it was a fairly large collection. I then went back to Frank's house. We went through everything and boy, does Frank play really good poker. He went through the numbers with me. I explained to him what I could offer and very stoically says, is that the best that you can do? And rather than give him a one word answer and just say yes, I try to explain to him how carefully I went through his collection. I went through the numbers. If he had any questions for me about any of the values I put on, I had the entire handwritten evaluation. I had my laptop there as well when I took the information from the handwritten notes and I put it there. So I had everything, I was on top of it. And one of the things I pride myself on when I'm buying collections, I don't get them all, but I get a lot of them, is I shoot for the bullseye. And what that means for the folks that are watching that may not quite understand the terminology in the baseball card you know, deal-making world, is if I want to pay $1,000, I don't offer 500. Because if you do that, you might get the deal every once in a while, but you're more than likely not going to, you're going to have to come up and negotiate, and you're going to have a bad reputation. And one of the ways that my company, JustCollect.com, has been able to get collections like Frank's over the last 30 years is because people who are watching our videos, they enjoy the way that we tell the story. And if they ever have cards themselves, or they run into a friend, a family member, a neighbor that might have cards, they know who they would recommend. So we wrapped up on Friday after he played his poker face 
and I explained to him when I went through the collection, I'm willing to discuss any and all of it, but the offer I've made to you is the best that I can do. And you know, sometimes I'll make an offer, I'll have a little bit of flexibility, but I really wanted Frank's collection, and I believe this, just like in sports, no matter what your favorite sport is, leave it all on the court, leave it all on the field. And I really appreciate Frank understanding that. We did reach a deal. I got the cards, I met with a friend, I had to bring the entire collection into a hotel because I stayed an extra night in the area and the folks were looking at me in the hotel like, what's going on here? I just kept my head down. So I left the cards in the safe, I hoped for the best. I was able to transport the collection safely back home to our offices here in Milner, New Jersey. And I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you'd like to learn more about the other collections that we have here at Just Collect, check out our blog at blog.justcollect.com and subscribe to our channel. Stay tuned for part two of this amazing collection.